Hi, this is Jennifer. You're listening to The Service Design Show, episode 211. Yes, we often celebrate design's power to solve wicked problems. But what if it also has been used to create some of the biggest challenges we face today? Let's get a little bit uncomfortable and explore that in this episode. Hi, if you're new here, welcome to the Service Design Show, where we invite the brightest minds in our field and explore what's needed to design great services that resonate with people, push businesses forward, and honor our planet. Our guest today is Jennifer Rittner, a teacher at the Parsons School of Design who's not afraid to challenge the status quo. With a background that spans dance, museum education and design, Jennifer brings a unique perspective to the table. She's also an author and her book, The Black Experience in Design, is a testament to her commitment to amplify diverse voices. But what really sets Jennifer apart is her comfort with ambiguity and her relentless pursuit of questions, not just answers. And today, she's going to push us to rethink some of the most basic assumptions about design and the world around us. So in today's conversation, you are going to learn about the hidden complexities of social dynamics and how they shape the way we design. We'll explore the ethical dilemmas design professionals face when balancing client needs with the long-term impact of their work. Jennifer will challenge us to think beyond the surface and consider the unintended consequences of our work. We'll discuss the role of education in shaping the next generation of designers and how to foster a more critical and reflective mindset. And we'll even touch on the idea of a service landfill, a thought provoking concept that might just make you see the field of service design in a whole new light. Jennifer's approach to design is all about asking the right questions and embracing complexity. It's a refreshing perspective in a world that often pushes us towards easy answers and quick fixes. If you are ready, to flex your critical thinking muscle and explore the deeper implications of design, this conversation is just for you. Okay, enough from me. Let's hear what Jennifer has to say. And don't forget to stay tuned for my reflections at the end. We'll unpack some of the big takeaways together. I'm your host, Mark Fontijn, and you are listening to The Service Design Show. Welcome to the show, Jennifer. Hi, thank you, Mark. I'm very interested in the topic that we're going to explore today. I sort of feel a little bit intimidated because this is absolutely yeah. a topic that I feel a complete beginner about. So just more to learn for me. Um, you wanted to explore the topic of recalibrating social dynamics today. Is that correct? Yeah, that is certainly one of the things that I'm most interested in right now as an educator. Yes. Can you can we start by sort of grasping what do you mean with social dynamics in the first place? Mm, just generally how people are interacting with um, under developing, building, understanding with one another, understanding the social dynamics of individuals and how that informs our behavior in social spaces, in political interactions, but also how those social dynamics inform the kind of work that we do and how as an educator, <clears throat> we're actually teaching young people to think about the values that are embedded in the social dynamics that they are enacting And thinking about the social dynamics that they then bring into their work as we think about design as the way in which we are mediating or mitigating people's experiences with one another in spaces um, and again, in sort of social behavior. There is so much to unpack here. Um, maybe first, let's look at 
um, your background and how design relates to social di dynamics. Like you're an educator, uh, you're an author. Like what is your relationship to this topic? So I'll start by saying that as a biracial, multi-ethnic person, my perception of myself, my perception of the world and other people's perception of me are actually three different ways that I develop social, uh, that in which I engage in social dynamics with others. Which is to say that as a biracial person, I have an understanding of both the absurdity and the very realness of race and ethnicity. Um, as it applies to these people in my life, these parents, this black woman mother, this white man father who have these identities that that inform their understanding of one another and how they how absurd like the idea of blackness is or whiteness is in relationships, in interpersonal relationships um, that outside of my family their ideas about race, blackness and whiteness, Catholicness and Jewishness that are very different from the interpersonal relationship that I see in my own family. And so having that view, being inside of a biracial, multi-ethnic family allows me to kind of observe the differences between these interpersonal dynamics and the socio-political dynamics that are in play in the in the world outside. So there's there's that part of my observation of social dynamics and how they are sort of paradoxical interpersonally and then politically. Then there is the way in which people perceive me and treat me because of how they understand my race or ethnicity, that there is a way in which I am perceived um, inaccurately or inadequately because of other people's perceptions or or assumptions or predilections, whatever we want to say, biases related to their understanding of race. And that there are um, the way in which we relate, the social dynamics that we have with one another uh, are, are informed by whether or not we can have open and clear conversations about the paradoxes or the assumptions or the biases or whatever that are held. And I think that as designers and design thinkers or design educators or design makers, the work that we do all necessarily makes assumptions about people, individuals, their positionalities, their identities, and their social behaviors, how they interact with one another. And the work that we can do and why I think it's interesting to think about these complex paradoxical social dynamics is that I think we're always trying to understand how to be how to be better humans with one another is almost kind of like the clearest way of saying like, how do we just be better humans with one another so that we make things that are more human and are allowing us to behave in more human ways with one another. Um, the social dynamics have to be hmm, understood in their complexity rather than as we you know have done i think sometimes in the past of thinking about persona there's this persona and this is a black person's persona and so we understand them in this way that is sort of conditioned or predicated on a particular way of understanding blackness or whiteness or maleness or femaleness or able-bodiedness or disabledness that there are these kind of clear definitions that we can place on each of those identities or experiences without then saying actually those things are they're they're so multidimensional and so we have to see them differently which is not to say that we see them yeah we just to see them differently and with, with more complexity did that answer your question that's a tough question to answer that actually uh <laughs> answered my question um but you're bringing up a lot of interesting things. So yes, thinking in personas and in user groups and avatars, whatever, stereotyping, reducing complexity. Um, my question there would be, is there a viable alternative? So let me, let me add some context to this. From what I've experienced in the design process, we are always trying to simplify and reduce complexity to make things manageable and uh, re bringing seeing patterns 
uh, in the needs of people or the desires of people, of the pains of people, uh, helps us to focus limited resources on designing something that addresses a larger group. Um, so the, the question here, like, how far can we go without reducing complexity and still yeah. being able to m m have a workable design process? I'm going to step back from that a little bit because I, I have been thinking about, as an educator, what is the role that I play as an educator in moving young people through a process of learning that allows them to become more ethical, skilled, responsible, thoughtful designers? And I teach in a design school. Specifically, I teach in a program that is about strategic design, which I think encompasses service design and spatial design and it, it, management of design, leadership in design, and so on. Um, the students that I teach are not necessarily technical makers. They are more strategists. And I think that as I have sort of reflect, and when I was teaching at the School of Visual Arts, similarly, I was in teaching mostly in programs, master's programs, that were teaching students a kind of range of technical skills, but were mostly teaching them to be thoughtful, strategic thinkers who could help frame the way in which design was happening at a higher level. So systems, services, strategies. And one of the questions that I've been asking myself is, how are we moving them through a process of learning and thinking that is not just solution oriented, where we go, there's this process, you do all of these things in a particular order, and then you get to a solution that in fact, as in higher education, our, our role or our goal is also to support learning at a higher level so that when they go into the field to become strategists and technical makers, they are they are drawing from a process of thinking and interrogating and critiquing and being reflective. And that the balance, I think, the calibration that needs to happen in design schools, where you're not doing a technical, right, product design, technical design, where you have to really know how structurally to get something to be, have like structural integrity, right, and to, to produce an end, but in these more strategic service-oriented ways, how do we calibrate the education so that they actually have a grounding in theory? In I mean, I, I don't know about you, and I would love to hear your experience of this, but I attended... I attended a liberal arts program. I did my undergraduate work as in a liberal arts program. Uh, and then I did my graduate work as an educator. So most of my higher education education has been a very balanced more heavily, weighted more heavily toward theory with moments of practice because the grounding in theory is actually what allowed me to become a reflective, thoughtful, ethical, right, thinker and 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 practitioner. So, where what I think in answer to your question, what I think is is useful in service design, strategic design is having people who have all of these larger liberal arts humanistic or if you will, like in higher education, humanities-based ways of operating around questions that they can then apply specific skills toward. So then when I look at, for example, I had to take my my child to the mall yesterday. We went to a mall. We don't we almost never go to a mall, but we were in a mall. And there are little vape kiosks in the mall. And I think of the mall as a place where teenagers generally go. Adults go there too, obviously. But it's a place for teenagers to go and shop. They have a little bit of independence if you live in a suburb. And there are these vape kiosks all over the mall. And those things are built as a service. That's service design, all these vape shops. In the urban center where I live, there are vape and and uh, weed stores all over. 
And that's produced by service design. Um, Vivek Murthy, the, the Surgeon General of the United States right now, is talking about putting warning labels on social media because the design of social media has made it addictive and has undermined the mental health of young people. Um, gambling sites, which are developed by service design, are addicting younger and younger people under the age of actual legal use of gambling. Um, they're not they're not legally allowed to, but they have the ability to uh, use these gambling sites. They, they're becoming more and more addicted to gambling. These are all designed by service designers on some level. Somebody who's doing service design is operating those things. UX designers, service designers, strategic designers. So there is the making of the thing that you can center as like, well, somebody has asked me to do this. I've got a design brief. I have a client brief and I'm going to see it through because the, the, the issue here is to finish the job, do the work, get the money, produce the thing, and that you can be very successful at doing that by learning the skills that are right sort of required to make design things. But from a liberal arts, humanities, complex, like human thinking uh, perspective, what is our ethical responsibility around designing services or perpetuating services or or supporting the design of these things that are doing real harm, especially to young people. Not especially to young people, but obviously that's that's one of my concerns, right? So I think that a, a more liberal education that teaches people to be, again, ethical, reflective, thoughtful, complex, critical, is necessary so that we're not just applying these skills to areas of design, to areas of business, to areas of the economy, of social life, of cultural life, that we look back on and say, we've actually done some real meaningful harm there. I would be very curious to know, when you've been reflecting on how you show up as an educator and like the next generation of designers that you're putting up in the world, how has your approach, your approach, change what are you are you doing something different than i don't know five ten twenty years ago i am but i mean that's partly a matter of just the the conditions in which i'm finding myself so when i started teaching in at parsons when i, I started teaching in higher education i was teaching as a part-time faculty at parsons and i was invited by a fabulous educator um dr susan yelovich who is no longer at Parsons, but she's actually a wonderful design educator. And she was leading a course, the title of which I'm really going to sort of butcher a little bit, but it was something like um, design and uh, art, art, culture, and design in the 20th century or something like that. But it was meant to be a liberal arts framing that was required of all juniors at Parsons. And regardless of whether you were studying photography as your major or fashion design or product design or strategic design, you had to take this course of, I think it was issues, maybe it was like issues in art and culture of the 20th century, something along those lines. This was back in the 20th century. <laughs> it then changed over to the 21st century, right? Okay. So um, the, the, the course was essentially how I understood education is like this liberal arts foundation. Now, I then started teaching studio courses, so design research, design development, in which my approach could still draw from this liberal arts tradition. Now, I think that I'm back to um, what's changed. I think that the the field of service design and strategic design has changed and have become much more salient. So people are learning more of these or, or learning and going into parts of design that are more abstract, right? Um, I think that when I started teaching at Parsons, they were much more tangible design skills that they were learning, like photography or fashion design or product design or graphic design. And so the abstractness of strategic design or service design 
requires us to think about the extent to which we are teaching young people to become this type of designer versus to be a, again, sorry, I'm not exactly answering your question because I'm thinking about the answer to the question. It's like, what has changed? What has changed is that the field has changed. What I think has changed is that the way we're teaching has changed. And so we have to think about our responsibility to, to understand how, what we are teaching and how we're teaching. I think I'm more reflect, I think I'm more reflective and questioning. Oh, and qu AI just gave me a thumbs up, but that's not real. Uh, and I'm spending more time thinking about and reflecting on the way in which the education we're providing is doing the what we need it to do for young people going out into the field. Mark, I'm curious. I'm going to turn it around on you because I think that uh, that was a very long-winded question that answer that didn't really answer your question. But it, like, maybe we can get to it this way. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Can I ask you what you studied? What was your field of study that got you into service design? <laughs> My study, well, maybe it is related, but I studied software engineering. And that's not how I got into service design. So how did you get into service design? I, I met uh, somebody who had a traditional design background and traditional in the sense product design. And that opened the world of design to me, basically. And how did you marry those two skills to you, do you think? The, the way I've married those two is that <clears throat> what I took away from my education is a very, is, is, is a systematic approach to problem solving. And um, I was thought with a design material, which was software code. That was the material in which I was shaping and crafting solutions. But then I re later realized that if you are able to step away and let go of the material, that that approach still has a lot of value in many different areas. So it wasn't too hard for me to start designing with relationships or with connections or with services, with time, right? Does it make sense? Yeah. When you were studying software engineering, were you in a in a science and tech program or was did you have a sort of foundational liberal arts education as well and not software at all. engineering was your major not at all no it was really highly technical yeah do you feel that you ha how do you feel that you learned about the relationship between the things you were making and the impact it had on people and communities and society general generally interesting um i think this is what got me interested in i didn't know that it was service design but i really quickly realized during my studies that i wasn't really interested in the challenge of building a solution if the solution and not if the solution didn't end up impacting people so very often, especially with highly technical things, you make something that is quote unquote a solution, but it's a solution to a non-existing problem. And I was already experiencing that very early on in my very fresh career. And that was for me the trigger to start thinking about like, what if we could actually figure out what the solution needs to be before we start building it? Do you think that that was a helpful way of it, was that helpful to you? And what does that mean? How do you how do you approach that? Was it helpful? Uh, the, that's a tough question to answer because compared to what, like there is no there is no alternative. Um, I, yeah, I, I, was it helpful? I would say so. Yeah. Do you think that designers spend enough time reflecting on and critiquing their own work? as a way of understanding, again, this is service design, right? And so you're looking at uh, these, these systems, these organizational spaces and realities and processes that people engage with as user consumers or user patients or user publics, if you will, 
And then as user laborers, people who are keeping the system running, people who are paid to make sure that things right are providing the service that the user, consumer, publics wants. Do you think that the that designers spend enough time reflecting on the impact on real long-term, like meaningful impacts that the work that they're doing have on people on both sides of that, but also on the communities in which those things are situated? The classic answer any design professional would give here is it depends. <laughs> yeah. Because it depends on the challenges that you're working on, the organizations, the debrief that you get. Uh, is it enough? Um, I think if we look at the state of where we are with our world, uh, it would be hard to say that it's enough. But this is also maybe a good moment to sort of uh, give it back to you. What I've been noticing in design in the recent years is that the notion of what good design means and what it looks like is expanding. It's taking more. It's becoming more dimension, more dimensional, more multi-dimensional. Uh, we're looking at sustainability. We're looking on the impact of, on our planet. We're looking at the impact of communities. Um, so. It's becoming it's becoming more complex to do good design, and I'm curious how you feel about like how do you hold how to which extent can we sell can we hold ourselves accountable to doing good design when there are so many factors to consider? I think part of the answer to that has to do with the history of how many of our design studies and design fields have emerged. You know, graphic design largely comes out of advertising, innovation design, strategic design, service design are coming out of product design or, or industrial design. And so what are the what are the standards that were put into place when those fields were emergent or have emerged that um, define what impacts look like, what responsibility, what ethics look like, what long term uh responsibility for outcomes looks like. I don't think that there, it, it seems to me, it seems to me that we um, talk quite a lot about impact, but we use marketing language and marketing processes to talk about impacts. What does that mean? Which, by which I mean that uh, design firms have done a very good job of writing about the impacts they are having I or will have or plan to have or hope to have, but I don't know what research they've done to actually track those. So in social sciences and medical sciences, research and academics are doing this now in, in design as well, but for since early in the development of social sciences and medical sciences, the, the part, there's a, there's a, a, an entire industry that is also specifically about research on impacts that looks at, right, if we're going to introduce this medicine, this practice, this type of therapy um, to the public, we need long quantitative and qualitative research that seeks to understand the impacts of this medicine, of this therapy, of this whatever the thing is, right? And in design, we do it by saying often case studies are written by people who say our impact was the client was happy, the community was happy. Uh, these are not meaningful, long right, longitudinal studies to actually look at what happened when we introduced this service? What happened when we introduced, for example, Uber Eats as a service into uh, into cities and, or just Uber generally? <laughs> any, any service, just think of, you know, you could go anywhere, Netflix. Um, what longitudinally, what are the impacts that we understand there to be on? Uber Eats, the restaurants that used to have people who would come in and sit and actually have social relationships with one another in physical spaces and what it meant to have those people come into downtown areas. What does it mean for transit corridors and the way in which people who are doing Uber Eats are sort of like, you know, creating the traffic, new forms of traffic in communities, et cetera, et cetera. Labor, unionizing, right? All, all kinds of things because these are complex and transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary um, uh, 
design uh, outcomes that need transdisciplinary and complex forms of research to understand, again, what the impacts are. So you need standards and then you need studies that look at how we are applying those standards. And we also need them to shape the standards based on how these outcomes are informing both positively and negatively, the, right, the, con the consequences of the things that we're putting into practice. Um, and so I think the, you know, the answer is we need to what what the question it's another question because i don't know what the answer is but i think the question is who was responsible for making sure that there are longitudinal studies that are showing us what impacts are so that we can have a better set of standards that then we use in order to make things from the beginning we go we understand when we look forward in time based on studies that we have read that this has this potential to lead to this potentially negative consequence and how do we mitigate against that a, a clear sign that these questions were not asked uh five fifty years ago are the landfills that we see right now so all the products that have been put into the world where design has had a huge role obviously yeah. um it's an indication that those questions weren't asked and i'm i'm trying to visualize what a landfill metaphorically of services would be and i think when we look back and uh, not to bash on any service but we will say like uber that had a pretty significant impact airbnb had a significant impact so um <laughs> the question might be here like are we too late uh, we're never too late but um so so if we come to this realization that we're not asking the questions and nobody is forcing us there is no regulation right now that that will come in 50 years <laughs> or hopefully uh, sooner um where do we go from here uh, i want to go to the landfill question first because i'm glad that you brought that up and i think that you you are right i think that metaphor is so apt in part because we are still not holding brand designers, packaging designers, graphic designers accountable for the amount of consumer waste that they are actually responsible and supporting industries that provide that produce consumer waste. Right. Um, when I was, you know, when I worked at Pentagram Design and when I worked in in at the AIGA, and people would say, well, you know, it's the it's such a cliche now. It's such a cliche now. But designers would say, well, we don't do cigarettes and guns. And I don't know, I can't remember what the third thing was, but it was like cigarettes and guns. There was a third one, maybe porn. Drugs. <laughs> Drugs, maybe, I don't know, you know. Um, but the, at least those two, you go, okay, we're not doing those. Yeah, but everything you're producing is getting produced on plastic. You know, we did work for Coke. Nobody said, no, we, can, we can't work for Coke unless, the stip you know, here's the stipulation. Nothing we produce will get actually, nothing we design will get produced on plastic. Well, that's not, I mean, that's not even feasible, right? Um, and by the way, there are many things that we use that are plastic, that are part of the post-consumer waste problem, the landfill problem, that are absolutely necessary, things in, in, you know, medicine and hospitals. And so there are plenty of reasons to not just completely you know, say, oh, plastic is the worst evil in the world. But the movement from making potable water unavailable in public spaces, in parks and on sidewalks, so that we can have an industry that sells us bottled water is a part of a larger problem where we go, well, we were there to solve the problem of, of packaging bottled water, not of understanding the infrastructure of the, the public water system right and the way in which urban centers simply need to have potable water available to all humans if you want it for your dogs too um you know but when you're operating in silos you can only uh, you can only answer the question that's being put before you i don't know what the answers are mark right i think that as an educator i'm actually lucky that i don't have to come up with all the solutions to these things the thing that i think we're operating around as educators is the question of how are we producing young people who have technical skills so they can make things they really legitimately can make things and the ethical foundations which is which includes historical precedented you know the a view of history a view not just of the history of an industry which is important and they should have the history of the industry 
you know, service design as a as concept didn't really develop until the 1980s as a concept. So what came before it? Because there were services before it. So how were services built from the beginning of time when we could say this was these were services in communities to people from one another? What does that look like? interpersonally? What does it look like as as small community affairs, right? How do we understand the history? How do we understand the geopolitics of these things? So how do we understand, develop a larger, more global view? How do we develop the skills of critique to ask not just about this thing that exists in the world here, here as a little ball, not just the thing that exists in the world and we go, well, it exists and we should just make more of them, but like actually look at it, ask what, what is its purpose? What, what is its social function? Um, why does it matter? Where did it come from? Like literally spending time in critique. And I, and I know, and we do that by the way, you know, education does that. I don't want to suggest that educators are not doing that. They're incredible design educators who are doing unbelievable work of getting students to be thoughtful and critical. But I wonder when we look at Uber Eats and Netflix and, and vape shops and more weed branding that I, you know, you could ever even imagine 10 years ago, you could imagine how much like weed branding there is. If we are taking seriously the 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 long-term impacts of the way in which we can we know how to solve problems because we've learned these very clear processes to get from a question to a solution, but we're not necessarily doing the big, again, humanities level thinking around it that that forces us to be critical um, and and to to push back against industry and to not just be tools of industry, but to be instruments of culture. And I think that there's a difference, right? To be a tool of industry is to say, anyone can come to me and give me a design brief and I'm willing to answer it. And an instrument of culture says, I understand my situatedness, that the things I make are reflective of and will shape the culture to come. For anyone who's listening and interested to, uh, I have more background on this. I highly recommend the conversation with George A, uh, yeah. where we also discuss this <laughs> in a, from a different lens. So that's a great complementary conversation. When you say, and I would agree, and I recognize the situation that we're not taking the humanities approach, we're not taking the culture approach. If we come to the conclusion that it is important, that it is valuable, What's holding us back? A lot of students are coming into design schools, in particular in programs like mine, but I think in design school generally, with the understanding that they're going to learn these specific skills so that they can graduate and get jobs. And there's a real anxiety, and you read about it all the time, the anxiety that young people feel about being hireable and being able to you know, have career trajectories that allow them to have the things to be part of consumer culture, to be a part of a luxury culture, to be a part of a right an economic culture um, that is defined as success. So the schools are often also responding to the desires and the needs and the demands of students and their families who want them to come out with skills and get jobs. And I think that we've also been a little bit, I think, Mm -hmm. uh, the, there is a, there are design skills in in higher education that come from art and design traditions. And I would say graphic design is one of them. I would put product design in there. I think architecture is situated there too. They come out of art and design disciplines and histories. But I think there's this other service design, strategic design, these other more systems oriented designs that are really not as closely aligned to those practices, that they're coming more from social sciences and from the technical, uh, right? So they're coming from business, they're coming from tech, and they're coming out of social sciences. And I think to some extent, we are shoving these service and strategic design uh, uh, disciplines in with the art and design disciplines in a way that's not necessarily helpful. What happens if you teach service design and strategic design uh, and other systems level design in programs that are actually about social sciences and where they're more embedded with forms of research and uh, critical praxis 
not just we make things and there's a process for making things. I don't know if it would shape it, cha- how meaningfully it would change things, but I wonder if the conversation and the way people are coming through the discipline would actually be recalibrated toward long-term impacts and not just producing. You know, when you work in a studio culture, the studio says at the end of studio, you have made something. But in strategic design and service design, in systems design, you're not just making a tangible thing. You're setting in motion a series of steps or outcomes that will cascade. And so you have to understand them as continuing impacts, not just a single thing that enters the culture and then it's sort of finite. So I I wonder if we are um, potentially doing a disservice to these forms of, or innovation design too, you could put it in there, innovation design, service design, strategic design, systems design. We need to maybe disentangle it more from the studio culture of graphic design, product design, architecture. Does that change the way it's practiced? Does it change the way students are learning them? Does it then change how we apply the standards? Because social sciences do have standards um, and they have, the, and it's just, to some extent, they're not perfect either. <laughs> A lot of things happen in those in those fields that are also questionable. But I think there's more of a regulatory uh, system. Mixing the design and arts and design and science, maybe, or design and, and business design and management. Um, and yes, uh, when I look in, for instance, in the Netherlands, where I'm situated, where strategic design or service design is thought, it's mostly in uh, universities that have an industrial product design background. So there is a certain mindset about what education looks like and what you need to produce. Um, Maybe there are already other universities uh, here that are approaching this from, like you said, the more of a humanities and the arts perspective. I would guess so, but they haven't been as prevalent. Um, we are here right now in the situation that is current. Um, how do we move from where we are today to a future that might be a bit more brighter? And like you said, more not human oriented, be, be better humans to each other. I think you phrase it like that. Like what, what is a good first step? I mean, this is a, not a very satisfying answer. I think there are many next first steps. There is not one. This is part of the the desire to make things efficient and and simplify doesn't necessarily get us to what's better mm-hmm. long term. I know that in many many designers who are doing work locally, situatedly, indigenously, based on historical practices, the centering of repair, or if you will, to think about rebuilding, reshaping what equity looks like from a strategic systems, policy oriented, if you will, even service point of view, those things are sometimes happening, many of them are happening all the time in, in very positive ways, but they, they're they not the big ones that we can look at and go, well, those are the evils of the world. They're not as prominent, right? You know, colleagues like June Grant in Oakland and Liz Ogbu and my, my uh, colleague, Courtney Morgan, who are doing work in communities where They're looking at repairing, a lot of it is around repairing social spaces, repairing communities that have been destroyed because of of inequity, because of uh, uh, environmental damage, because of politics, right? The destruction of, of urban spaces in particular. And those designers are in community where they are really doing work to facilitate change Mm. with the people who are asking for change at a community level. But that's not the kind of work that's happening from a 
corporate client perspective, corporations are there to sustain themselves. They're not really operating at the level of like, how do we make small communities work better for themselves and not for our benefit? So, which again, I think just goes back to the question of, are we teaching young people, are we teaching designers that their work is most meaningful when it is a tool of industry? And the idea that design is that, it is principally a tool of industry, is then always going to produce things that are not for people, but are for corporations. The question there would be, uh, yes, if design is a tool for industry, what type of industries are we designing? And what types of industries do we want to be part of? So um, I think the, uh, the number of examples of industries that are regenerating nature, communities, um, we, it, it's pretty limited compared to the number of industries that are here to extract wealth and grow shareholders' value. But there is a way forward. You, you can have an industry that's actually profitable and contributing to society, right? So it's fine if design is an, a tool of industry. The question is, what industry do you want to be part of? I mean, I guess I wonder if... I, I think about all the projects that we worked on when I was at... I'll you know go back to pentagram design. And the projects that were the most, I think, meaningful and did the least damage were the projects that we did for institutions, uh, art institutions, the public theater, the New York City Ballet, you know, where we were bringing people into conversations around culture. The least successful are the ones that we did for large corporations where the goal was simply to you know, it, it, uh, enforce more consumption. How would you um, how would you define success? So, uh, how do you look back on this and add the label of success? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, again, I think the metrics are so oversimplified. There, success meaning that a brand campaign for uh, the ballet increased the number of people who went to the ballet over the next, you know, several years, five years or so, right? And so increasing their profile and getting young people to find this cultural outlet at a time when, you know, maybe many of them were starting to move into, they did not realize that it was also designed for them, for example. So long term, I didn't do the longitudinal study. I think it would be really interesting to go back and look at every single one of those projects and say, what does success look like in the long term? Uh, and that I cannot tell you. Because that's a really good question. I do think, though, that the the companies that we worked for, the the corporations whose mission was simply to further right the sort of consumption to increase consumption, I look at those, and many of those are those they are extractive, they're exploitive, they're um, they're. Uh, hierarchical in ways that disenfranchise workers all along the line. They are doing things in parts of the world that are invisible to most of us who are using those products. They are doing damage to especially the banks that we worked for that are continuing to do damage to small communities. And they, they can do enough to say, oh, no, no, we're actually trying to help small communities while also being extractive. So, you know, they're also, if you will, I, I don't want to use this, you know, overuse this, but also gaslighting the public into believing that they're doing some good when actually they're doing huge harms. So, you know, design can have people who are designers have choices. I also think there's this, I, I hate to say a very unpopular point of view. Um, but I think that the idea that designers should be, uh, we are all driven to earn a, li a living that is meaningful, that we can actually survive. I, in no, no way do I want to suggest that, you know, designers are by and large overpaid, especially if you talk to, you know, younger designers definitely are not overpaid. They're traditionally underpaid and and often very undervalued in workplaces. Um, but I think that, you know, I've heard people say that they're trying to, they come out of 
design school or they were a junior designer for a couple of years and now they're ready to make like a high six figure salary a couple of years into their into their professional life and i just think if is is that what design is is that the draw that design and designers are again sort of t tools of a sort of an economic machine rather than these producers of culture that shape everything about how people live in the world and that the reward of that is like the to be a person who is informing culture i don't know it's a it's not a very well formed thought i wouldn't even i wouldn't even I, I i don't know i don't even know if that's worth saying i don't even know if that's worth saying i uh, everything is worth uh putting out there and seeing where it lands but we are seeing that uh, there is a very strong economic incentive towards or for design. That's very clear for when you're working uh, inside business that needs to make a profit. That economic incentive, again, is quite obvious. Those other incentives, um, at this point, in, a, in most situations, they have to come from you as an individual and from your moral and ethical compass because... Right now, nobody is going to demand from you to design a service that's not going to end up on the service landfill, right? So asking these questions, it won't come. Nobody will ask you to ask these questions. You have to have this dialogue with yourself and maybe the wider community. Yeah, I think that designers, I, I, you know, I think designers should be skilled makers but I also think that this is, again, this goes right back to the earlier point. They, they have to, I, I think, that in a very complex, in, we are in a very complex global social um, environment. Everything we make affects people in places where we will never step foot. And the assumptions that we make about people, about their lives, the invisibility of people who we don't consider, the way in which the design briefs that we receive can be very narrow, very focused, and therefore leave all of these other concerns on the margins. These don't serve us as designers, and we need, I think, much more complex design agencies that have a range of skills in them, not just the strategists who can get us to the end point, not just the makers who can get us to the end point, not just the, the you know, the marketing people who can help us craft the narrative around why the thing we made was exactly the right thing that needed to be made, and then we can submit it for awards and be very proud of it. But actually, the range of other disciplines that allow us to be critical thinkers, because design agencies are doing work of culture, they're doing work that has economic impact, social impacts, environmental impacts, behavioral impacts, mental health impacts, medical impacts. And these things are happening even in these tiny little areas where you go Uber Eats, figure out that service better, right? Or Netflix, make that service better. Or vaping, make that service better. Don't make that service at all. But, you know, and so the, the design firms need to be not just places where designers and strategists work, but are actually inside of other spaces that are doing the kind of critical, you know, social, not just social impact yeah, yeah. as a quote unquote, right, social impact, but understand the sociology, the behavioral economics, the behavioral um, uh, psychologies and so on. Those, when we talk about co-creation, we're going to co-create, we're doing all this co-creation. Everybody's doing co-creation. Everybody thinks they're doing co-creation. Okay, fine. So you want to be designing with people. Design with people, not just for people, not just at people. Great. That all sounds really great. Nobody knows how to do that. Nobody, not even myself, right? I think everybody has some version of that that's trying really hard because we really think that belief, that's real. That's a real and meaningful belief that we have, that we have to stop just like designing at people in particular when the people who are designing have power and autonomy and incentives for their own success and the people we're designing things for are disenfranchised and marginalized and voiceless and powerless right and we go yes we want to bring them into the process and we can do that in increasingly more complex ways we give them compensation we give them credit we give them a voice. We don't just show them what we've made. We actually bring them in and they're part of this process all along. 
they're part of workforce development, right? So we're actually thinking about how design firms can actually be um, in partnership with workforce development so that the people in spaces where we're making things are actually part of the process of making at a much deeper level. Fabulous. That's fantastic, right? And co-creation and co-design and all of these words have to be inclusive of these other disciplines that will help us understand the things like long-term impacts, the behavioral sciences, the medical sciences, the environmental sciences, and so on, that are not just part of making the thing, but that are part of the environment in which the things that are made will have consequences. That I think that that's the co-creation part that's not being tapped at the moment, right? is we're still focused on, I'm getting to a solution. I'm affirmatively designing toward an end goal, right? I know I have to make something and there's an end goal and I have to get to it. And there's an efficiency in that. I can't waste a lot of time being thoughtful and critical because I've got a thing to make and I'm getting paid to make that thing. And bringing people in at a user level allows me to do that in a way that feels more equitable. And that's great, but it's still ignoring the situatedness that design does not exist. Nothing no, anybody makes is going to live in a vacuum. The vape shop and the all, all the things that we've named, right? They don't exist in vacuums. And so you still have to be inclusive of the larger uh, critical thinking around why are we making this thing? What is the thing that making this is actually going to dismantle or disrupt in a negative way. I know everybody disrupts in a, is a design thing, but not in a good way. Disrupt. What is it going to disrupt in the culture, in the individual's life, in their future, in the environment, in the in the labor force, and so on? And there's no time for that. There's no room for it because design firms are businesses that are making things. But they're also cultural spaces where the things that are made have impacts beyond how do we get paid for it? I, I know I'm sort of repeating myself, which is a terrible habit, but that I think is the space where opportunity lies is to make sure that there is you are situated in a space of critique and reflection, not just in making and then dealing with the impacts after the thing has been made. When we start reflecting and sort of uh, trying to imagine unintended consequences, do we even have a shot at moving forward? Because you will sooner or later always come up with unintended consequences that might be detrimental to something else. So let's not do this at all. How, how do yeah. you how do you balance that? Yeah, uh, that's right. I mean, I think that's right. I I think that many things that we're producing should not get made. So maybe that's a that's a positive thing. I think that the uh, I don't have the answers. You know, I think that. I'm maybe what I'm suggesting is that we need more lab cultures, lab cultures. That's not maybe that's a double entendre, but the idea of lab spaces where we're practicing and and doing the longitudinal research and honoring that research in a really meaningful way, not again just as a way to come up with new products. I think a lot of incubators <laughs> are about still coming up with new things and not doing the critical work to say like, oh, let's understand this again from a social sciences, right, sort of disciplinary approach or medical science disciplinary approach where we really are looking at impacts. And I think then if you if there is some makers make Makers should keep making. But where is the part of industry that's like we are operating as a lab that is really looking closely so that we have then some foundational knowledge for for whatever the evolution needs to be for setting some standards, mm. for putting in some stopgap measures, for un identifying red flags, right? For regulating, for developing some policy around different parts of design and, and user, uh, um, user research and, and co-creation and long-term impact. But because I don't know that we have that lab culture right? This idea of actually like sitting and putting a microscope against these things that are being made. It, it, there is, there is, it just is making and then waiting to see what happens. Exactly. Well, I would say that that's, that's the lab culture. Uh, the, the people who put stuff into the world, whether it's products or services, um, use society as guinea pigs and let others do the research, right? 
That's right. I think that that's exactly right. I think that we are using the public as guinea pigs and we're saying, well, because we come out of an art and design tradition and we come out of a business tradition, that's just how things happen in art, design and business. You just make things and then you just watch and see what the impacts are. And I think what I'm saying is that if we are serious about using terms like social impact, we are saying we understand the way in which the things we make shape behavior and and health and the environment and all of these things and those are social science impacts and therefore we should treat design as a social science that is studied in order to understand things before they reach the culture and have negative impact i mean do you, i don't um this is here here's this is so weird i'm going to give this example i realize we're probably out of time but i'm going to give this example anyway so in the i think it was in the 80s 70s 80s uh, the med medical scientists introduced lithium as a medication to treat manic depression, which is now called bipolar dis bipolar disorders. And a lot of people started taking lithium and longitudinally they realized that actually had very negative consequences on their health. Um, but some studies have been done to study the effects of lithium, but it did need to be into the public in order, it didn't need to, but it did enter the public. And then there was the understanding that actually it has negative consequences. You could say the same thing with opioids. It's a, it may, a lot of medications are studied and then introduced to the public and then more consequences are seen. And then right there, they they change the, the, the regulations around how they're used. Um, so, so saying that there is some way to study something is not saying, and therefore nothing will ever get made because there is no perfect way to learn things in a lab. You learn things in a lab, you put them in public, and then you actually see how they get metabolized in the world. And that will then shape your understanding of what you learned in the lab. And then, right, you see the, the delta between, and or you, right, anyway, you learn more from that experience. And I think that we can still do that, but we have to understand that we're putting a lot of lithium and opioids out into the public right now without any way of studying them. And social media is clearly one of those. And things like all of these delivery services that are really toxic for workers and all of the supply chain and fast fashion, these are all opioids that are out in the public right now. And there is no way to regulate them in a meaningful way from the perspective of designers who are the ones who are actually responsible for them to some extent. By the way, by the way, designers are not responsible for creating the, the the impetus for them, but we are still the designers are the ones who are materializing them and then saying, okay, well, but it wasn't, we weren't responsible. We just made it because they asked us to make it better or they asked us to make it more efficient or they told us that it had this value. And so we're like sort of sitting in the middle of it without having the full responsibility um, and being able to, you know, sort of, we did what we were supposed to do because we were a tool of industry. That position is very vulnerable, right? How do you, yeah. you, you don't have the power or, or, or no, do we have, terrible. well, well, do we have the power? I don't, I don't know who has the power. Nobody has the power. Nobody thinks they have the power or authority. Everybody says it's somebody else's. Mm. Mm. I mean, the, the power exists, I think, in the... So one of the reasons you have regulations and policies is that it actually creates some constraints because you then you can say, I am not allowed to do that, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. the policy makes it so that actually yeah. you get to have power within, right, the regulatory requirements to say no or to say we do it this way because this is the right way to do it. So do you think we will have... Uh, something similar to an ethical commission that you have around medicine in design or a bar? No, or... I, I don't. I don't actually think that that'll happen. <laughs> I mean, Sh I think historically, we? sure. Yeah, I think we're, I think that the, which is why working in education to me is interesting t for us to be asking the question of what is our role. Um. In create what how are we informing a potential shift in the field and i think that that's why you know when you ask things like well what do you want people to know i think what i want to know what i want to know and i want us to be conversing around is what are the gaps in the industry in the disciplines that we need to be addressing in education 
And how might some of those gaps actually be addressed within how we teach and what we teach, but also the policies that we are applying and how we can inform new policies and regulations through um, academia. I, I think it I think it should happen in academia, but in in close relationship with industries. And I think that we probably need to potentially um, be clear about what the disciplines are. When we say innovation designer, service designer, strategic designer, systems designer, graphic designer, whatever, what what is the container for that? And if the container is too narrow or if it's too porous, then how do we hold some where we say there have to be some regulations around anything that's made that does this? And then you say, okay, well, that includes that in, that's inclusive of service and strategic and transitional design or innovation design. You mentioned that you're curious about this, and I'm hopeful that our audience who are listening right now have some ideas or maybe some questions to ask or some examples or um, any anything that might might help this conversation forward. Uh, if they have, is there a way to sort of follow your work or uh, get in touch? I'm just trying to be a better educator. But if people are interested in talking about regulation, and I'm really, again, to me, the interesting question well, among the questions, uh, how is what we're doing in higher education informing how students are entering the field? And not just from a skills level, although the skills are important, I also think that we do need to know what are the skills students need to have that they are not coming into the field with, but also how how are we balancing and how do we need to continue balancing or better calibrating their their ethical standpoint, their humanities, if you will, liberal arts perspective on the world so that they don't make things to answer questions that are given to them by other people, but that they are informed by their own thinking and, and critical thinking about the world and their understanding of history and geo the, the geopolitics of the world and the future. I hope that our conversation has at least sparked some curiosity about this topic and that people will start going down the rabbit hole and um, learning more. Uh, being curious. So, uh, Jennifer, I want to thank you for joining us here today on the Service thank Design you. Show and sharing what's going on in your mind and what you're thinking about. Yeah, it was fascinating. Thank you, Mark. It was a pleasure talking to you. Well, that was quite a thought-provoking conversation with Jennifer. I don't know about you, but I'm still processing everything we discussed. One thing is for sure. Jennifer's passion for asking questions and embracing complexity is contagious. It reminds me that the best design solutions often come from digging deeper and challenging our assumptions. So let's all take a page from Jennifer's book and approach our work with a little bit more curiosity and a lot more critical thinking. I want to thank Jennifer once again for sharing her wisdom and inspiring us to be more thoughtful design professionals. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, you can do me one big favor. Click the like button on this video if you haven't done so already, not to feed the YouTube algorithm, but to let me know whether or not we are on the right track by addressing topics like this. Finally, before we part ways, Please take a moment to reflect and celebrate that by joining us today, you've directed your attention towards learning and growing as a professional. So from everyone who you are going to impact through your work, thank you for taking the time and making the commitment. My name is Mark Fontaine, and I look forward to see you again in a new episode of the Service Design Show. Take care and see you soon.